of Chapter 3, or Part B. And as you recall, we left off discussing Christian discipleship and how it becomes life's goal to the end to believe in Jesus Christ and follow him as Lord. We must recall that Jesus remains the one who gives. There is friendship with Jesus, but no equal partnership. The evangelist John insists that Jesus gives to those who believe in him and are willing to be molded by him. Now discipleship equally implies work in this world. Jesus Christ did not come to be a contemplative Buddha or guru turning inwardly to gaze upon the navel of inner being and origin. No, Jesus turned his mind, his heart, and his hands outwardly. He had compassion on the multitude. He said that the Son of Man came to serve and not to be served. So now we move into taking a look at an apostle of Jesus. What does that entail exactly? From this standpoint of a deeper understanding of discipleship, let's now turn to the concept of apostle. How did the early church understand the term apostle? The word itself comes from the Greek apostolos. In classical usage, the term denoted the sending of a fleet on a military expedition. It became a nautical term for a naval expedition. With time, it received a wider application embracing any group of people sent out on a particular enterprise, not merely an army, but bands of colonists and their settlements. In this classical definition, the term carries the idea of passivity because apostolos lacks initiative entirely. The apostles are people who obediently respond to their mission. And applying this classical definition, the twelve could be seen as obedient soldiers of Christ the King, sent forth to establish the kingdom of God on earth. So that's how that got started. Now, in the Greek classical definition, apostolos denotes the quality of being sent without conveying the idea of, say, being a messenger. In later work within the first century, Josephus, remember him, the Jewish historian? He uses the term to sig signify emissaries that were sent to Rome, emissaries. And in the Greek Septuagint Bible, Ahija is commissioned to deliver a message to the wife of the king Jeroboam. Now, generally, scholars agree that the proper understanding of apostles in the New Testament must be found within a Hebrew Aramaic background in order to really understand what it means. An adequate explanation of the term can be found in the rabbinic institution of the Silua, S-I-L-U-I-H, or in Aramaic, the language that Jesus spoke, Salua, S-A-L-U-A-H. And this was a legal rather than a religious institution, but one that was often used for religious purposes. Now, the Salua were those that were legally authorized to act in the name of another person or party. So you got to think a little bit like attorneys here. It consisted in authorized representatives being sent, and usually referred to them being sent some distances from the center to act legally or representatively in the name of the center. So these authorized people were, in essence, equivalent to ambassadors and empowered to act or speak in the name of another. Marriage engagements were often transacted through the Salua. So it was as if, as if you were dealing with that person who sent the messenger themselves. So the Salua represented the other person and all of his or her rights. So the rabbis believed that 
The one sent by a man is as the man himself. The, the treatment that is given to the salua would be directed toward the sender. So if he received bad treatment or good treatment, it was if you did it to the sender, which may have been a king, it may have been a high priest, um, and it basically could not be ignored by him. So usually the salua consisted of ordained rabbis. And notice that rabbis were ordained, just like our priests are today, who were set apart for their task by the laying on of hands in the name of the person or the party that they represented. And usually two or more representatives were sent. They didn't send them out single-handedly. They would go out in twos, just like the disciples were sent. Rarely would they be sent one alone. So the great Sanhedrin often sent forth rabbis as plenipotentiaries, <laughs> can you believe that word, to the diaspora. And uh, basically, I, I checked out that word, it means diplomats with full power. Plenis means full, and potens means power. So they would send them out to the diaspora. You remember what that is, the, the Jews that live beyond Palestine? They still refer to a lot of Jewish people, the diaspora, because they're kind of scattered all over the world. And they'd send them out to carry out a particular task for the Sanhedrin. Now, on the Feast of the Atonement, the Jewish high priest became for Israel now its solitary representative before the Holy of Holies. Do you remember we learned about that in some classes where he would come up and he would take on all the sins of the people and being a sinner himself, he'd have to go through atonement annually too. But he would be the representative going before the Holy of Holies like Moses was on the mountain to represent the people. And in the sense of the salua, we can see that an apostle is one who is committed by obedience to a mission a man under orders who, in order to fulfill his mission, he must empty himself out, so to speak. Sound familiar? Empty himself out so that he may adequately represent another. You see how this all points to Jesus emptying himself out and doing the work of the Father, which passes through to the apostles. So he acts not in his own name, the Salua, nor through his own power, but in the name and in the power of the sender, just like Jesus and the Father. So from the Gospel account, we note that Jesus gave his apostles the power now to cast out demons. What a disastrous mistake that would be if they sought to encounter such evil forces with just their own little weak souls. Can you imagine? You don't go walking in doing those kind of things. In fact, do you remember the story? There were these son, seven sons of a guy named uh, Sceva, and he was this Jewish high priest. And his sons went around trying to cast out demons in the name of Jesus. And uh, they came up to these really bad demons. And they said, in the name of the, that guy from uh, Nazareth. You know, I didn't even know how to say it right. You know, <laughs> you know that Jesus guy, yeah, the guy from Nazareth. And uh, the, um, the demon was a very powerful demon and looks at these guys and says, Jesus I know, Paul I've heard about, but who are you? <laughs> Can you imagine? He just, so he just like leaps at these guys, just shreds them, and they go running off all beaten up, bloody, and buck naked. Yep, that would be just like a demon would do. So, so you want to make sure you have the actual power that Jesus has given you before you walk around and try to meddle with those kind of things. So Jesus probably used the Aramaic salua, as opposed to salia, when he referred to the 12 as apostles. Now, as already noted, the 12 were first and foremost the disciples of Jesus, right? So being apostles was something other than being a disciple, but it was nonetheless a disciple. They're still a disciple, but this is a special class. So when Mark speaks of the selection of the 12 to accompany Jesus, he signifies that they will, in the future, become apostles. So they didn't really quite start out that way. 
during Jesus' ministry, the 12 are temporarily, temporarily commissioned to be apostles. All right, probably going, what's that all about? They're all, once apostle, always apostle, right? Well, when they completed their mission, they returned to their task of accompanying Jesus, being intimately associated with him and being schooled by him. But it's like us. We go out and we do our tasks, be it at Isaiah House or be it um, helping somewhere or going overseas and building water wells, whatever your project is. Then you come back to accompany Jesus. We come to church. We receive the Eucharist and we be schooled by him. We be attentive to the word we hear at Mass. We come to Bible study. We study at night and do our homework. It's the same thing for us. So as one studies their situation with the Lord, it becomes evident that the 12 were disciples and apostles, but they were something other than disciples and apostles. Only after the resurrection of Jesus do the 11, notice now Ju Judas had uh, defected and he, he died, as we know, did receive a permanent commission as apostles of Jesus Christ. Now think about why they're different here. Matthew records, Jesus came forward and addressed them in these words. Full authority has been given to me both in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go make disciples of all the nations and know that I am with you always until the end of the world. And now John the Evangelist, he gives this account. On the evening of that first day of the week, even though the disciples had locked the door of the place where they were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood before them. Peace be with you, he said. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. At the sight of the Lord, the disciples rejoiced. Peace be with you, he said again. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Wouldn't you just love to have been there that day? Isn't that just something? That's John 20, 19 through 20. So from that moment on, the lives of the 11 must be apostolic. We learn from Acts how the apostles interpreted their unique status as the 12. We see this in the business of determining who will replace the reprobate Judas. Now Peter stands up amidst the congregation, numbering about 100 and, uh, 120, and explained that Judas was, quote, one of our number, and he had been given a share in this ministry of ours. You see, God can hand you everything. You can have it all. You can be rich, you can be wealthy, you can be handed an apostolic mission to change the world, and with free will you can botch it up, let Satan come on in and have his way with you. So we always have to keep, keep that in mind, that we have to stay our eyes focused on Jesus. He had become this traitor and tragically ended his life. So Rather than coming back for repentance, he's out of there on that bad note. Not good. So speaking of our number, quote, and this ministry of ours, Peter distinguishes the 12 from the rest of the disciples. He goes on quoting scripture and says, may another take his office. And then he adds, it is entirely fitting, therefore, that one of those who was of our company while the Lord Jesus moved among us from the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us should be named as witness with us to his resurrection. You see the unique position, the unique role they have here? That's Acts 1, 19 through 22. So we see that a requirement for being one of the 12 has to be associated with the entire public ministry of Jesus. You had to actually have been there and to have witnessed his resurrection and his ascension. Why? Well, because you had to be a credible witness to people. People could say, well, yeah, you, you, say, you, saw, you say you know about this, but did you see it? So it was a, it's a unique group. In other words, he had become so familiar with Jesus personally 
these apostles, that he could verify without a doubt that the person he encountered after the death of Jesus on the cross was the same Jesus of Nazareth, glorified and raised from the dead. It's a very special appointment. So as Peter preached, this man God raised on the third day and granted that he be visible, not to all the people, but to us, the witnesses chosen by God in advance, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. All in one breath. So that's Acts 10, 40 through 41. So we must remember that the risen Jesus had undergone such a physical transformation through the resurrection that he was not really externally recognized by some of them. For example, one intimately associated with him, such as Mary Magdalene, remember at the tomb? And he's, notice when she did recognize him. She thought he was the gardener or something. Well, one thing your mind is just not expecting to see somebody walking around after you've seen what happened to them. It's one thing to hear they've died. It's another thing to see them slaughtered on a cross and buried in the tomb. And now you come back and this person's talking to you. And what is it that got her to know who he was? What made her recognize him? You remember? The voice. He said, Mary. Rabbi, or she says, Rabboni. That's kind of like the more affectionate term. And then we also have, now remember on the road to Emmaus? Maybe remember? Who, those, who was on the road to Emmaus, and they were having this discussion with themselves, and they were all downtrodden. Now, it says that one named Clopas uh, was the one who told Jesus the whole story. Are you the only guy that doesn't know what's going on around here? I mean, where have you been, buddy? It's kind of his attitude. And he's with somebody. It doesn't really say who he is, but I suspect it might have been Peter, because they say later, the Lord has raised and appeared to Simon. Where, where did that happen? It says that their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. It's kind of interesting that, you know, that veil that prevents people from coming to Christ. All of a sudden, here are all these disciples of his, and they don't even recognize him. And you're thinking, well, he didn't look the same. as he, What's going on? Skeptics will start up. And then all of a sudden, where do they recognize him? Do you remember? Breaking of the bread. The breaking of the bread. Bam! What happens when they recognize him? He disappears. You're kind of like, whoa! <laughs> so that's the thing. It's a, you got to look at the message in that. God comes and reveals himself to us. Makes you realize that it really is a gift. Because without it, you're not going to recognize him in his word. You're not going to recognize the Father in him. Like Philip said, well, show us the Father and we'll be happy. And Jesus is like, if I've been with you this long that you don't know, that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You know the Father. And we're all dunderheads. It's that gift of God that comes down upon us and gives us this ability. So anyways, moving on, Paul explains this change when he writes the Corinthians and he says, what is sown in the earth is subject to decay. But what rises is incorruptible. What is sown is ignoble. What rises is glorious. Weakness is sown. Strength raises up. A natural body is put down and a spiritual body comes up. So keep this in mind at the holidays with the passing of people and all the sickness and all the stuff that seems to happen. What better time than the holidays because you're, gonna, you're raising up with Christ. What a wonderful thing. What a blessing. I'd be thrilled to have my last day beyond Christmas, but I guess it would kind of bum everybody else around. I would hope I'd left lots of stickies all over the place. No, this is good. I'm with God. I have a party. <laughs> so what do you do? So the now were the official witnesses to the fact that this spiritualized Jesus Christ was the same Jesus of Nazareth that was crucified on Good Friday, died, and was buried. They saw it. So their intimate association qualified them to teach everything he had commanded. And their reception of the Holy Spirit did what? Empowered them to do it. You're just not going to get out of bed in the morning and go, yeah, I'm going to go tell the world about the Lord Jesus Christ is risen. You're not going to do that without the power of the Holy Spirit. 
for one, someone's, someone will ram your shopping cart or arrest you or <laughs> kick you or something. It takes the Holy Spirit just to get the gumption to get out there like that. So uh, to this ministry of the 12, as living witnesses of this resurrection, it was obviously a ministry now that could not be perpetuated in the church. Why? Because you had to be a, a physical witness of this. Okay, now, when the apostle James was martyred by Herod Agrippa, was he replaced? No, he wasn't. However, their mission to make disciples of the nations, to teach and sanctify, must continue through those ordained to do so. This was the universal mission of the church, of which the twelve had become what? The foundational stones. That's why we hear about it in Revelation, in John's vision, that they're the foundational stones. So people might be going, well, how come they're the only ones? Why not us? Can't we be like foundational stones? Wouldn't Mother Teresa or, or Pope Francis be one? Well, see, these had to be the witnesses that actually got it started. They had a special appointment. So now this brings into question, I know you're all thinking, what about the Apostle Paul? Okay, well, let's look at that. Now, Paul comes along and he insists that he equally stood with the 12 as apostles. Does that sound right? Hmm. Well, during our Lord's earthly life, we all know that Paul had certainly not been a disciple of Jesus, right? What was he doing? Exactly. He was running around trying to snuff every last one of them. So he came to faith in Jesus only after not only disbelief, folks, formal disbelief. This guy was a serious disbeliever in who Jesus was and being a persecutor of Christians. So it's amazing that God would call him. So however, Paul does insist that he is a witness to the resurrection of Jesus. Folks, I know it happened. Writing to the Corinthians, he says to them, last of all, as to one born abnormally, he appeared to me. For I am the least of the apostles, not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me has not been ineffective. Indeed, I have toiled harder than all of them. Not I, however, but the grace of God that is with me. Therefore, whether it be I or they, so we preach and so you believed. And that's 1 Corinthians 15, 8 through 11. So we have learned from Acts that Paul, as part of the Salua of who? The Sanhedrin, had a conscious and sobering encounter with the risen Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. So what was this? It was neither a vision, nor was this a mystical experience resulting from long prayer like most of the Jewish people would have thought back then. No, Paul has a head-on collision with the risen Lord on the highway to Damascus. And he found himself communicating now with a celestial being that is more dazzling than the sun. Can you imagine? So brilliant was he that it physically blinded. Now imagine that. Now you look at the sun. They say if you look at the sun. This, Jesus so fried his eyes, they were covered with scabs. Because remember when Ananias came and laid hands on him and he regained his sight, scales fell off. It like fried his, it was like a nuclear bomb. That's what nuclear <laughs> bombs do. They fry the skin on your eyes. So when Paul directly asked the person of Jesus to identify himself, the answer he received was the last thing he expected, not to mention the last thing he would want to hear. He says, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Oh my gosh. So Paul indeed became a witness, not only to the resurrection of Jesus, but to the Lord. He's seeing he's God. So later, we see from Acts that Barnabas and Paul were sent on a missionary journey, and we read, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, 
completing their fasting and prayer, they laid hands on them and sent them off. And that's Acts 13, 2 through 3. So here we go. Some are going to come along and insist that, um, that Paul was solely an apostle of the church at Antioch. And however, the words from Acts clearly manifest that both Barnabas and Paul were apostles of the Holy Spirit. It's a different kind of apostle calling. They were set apart for the Holy Spirit in order to do the work called for them to accomplish. And the scripture goes on to say that these two sent forth by the Holy Spirit went forth in the power of the Holy Spirit. And there's three accounts of his conversions in Acts, actually. And in the third account, the one that he gives before King Agrippa, these words of Jesus are related. He describes it as this is what happened. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Get up now and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness of what you have seen of me and what you will be shown. So in giving this account of what he had heard, he goes on, I shall deliver you from this people and from the Gentiles to whom I send you to open their eyes that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may obtain forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been consecrated by faith in me. Acts 26, 15 through 18. So after the encounter of Jesus on the way to Damascus, Paul was told in Damascus by the Christian prophet Ananias, you see there in that picture, that he had been made a chosen vessel. And he said that the God of our fathers long ago designated you to know his will, to look up to the just one and to hear the sound of his voice before all men you are to be his witness to what you have seen and heard, Acts twenty two fourteen. So now, what did Ananias actually do? Did he commission Paul? No. He only confirmed him, you see. He already had the commission. He confirmed it. So Paul visited Jerusalem after his conversion and had the following vision. He said, I was praying in the court of the temple where I fell into a trance and saw Jesus speaking to me. You must make haste, he said. Leave Jerusalem at once because they will not accept your testimony about me. Be on your way. I mean to send you far from here among the Gentiles. See, the Lord knew what was going to happen to him. They weren't going to put up with him. No way. They saw him as a turncoat on their own kind, being a Salua of the Sanhedrin. <laughs> Can you imagine? So Paul saw his vocation to the apostolate as comparable to the call of Jeremiah, set apart and called by God even before his birth. See, God allows these things to happen, but it's going to come full circle. So he told the Galatians, but the time came when he who had set me apart before I was born and called me by his favor chose to reveal his son to me that I might spread among the Gentiles the good tidings concerning him, Galatians 1.15. So to no man nor to any institution among men did Paul attribute his role as an apostle of Jesus Christ. God had integrated Paul into his plan for the salvation of mankind, and within that plan, Paul became an integral part. God made Paul basically indispensable in his plan. Paul, who had always sought submission to the will of God now, see this, even, even, even back when he was persecuting Christians, he thought he was serving God and rabid about it. He recognized God's favor and, and so utterly cooperated with his mission that he was actually able to proclaim, quote, the life I live now is not my own. Christ is living in me. How true is that to think he wrote the majority of our New Testament? 
the largest portion was written by Paul. So albeit Paul is not one of the 12 per se, but he is equally an apostle with them. Indeed, an exception to the rule, as he describes as one born out of due time or born abnormally. And he said, all of this is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and given us the ministry of reconciliation and trusting to us the message of reconciliation. So we are ambassadors for Christ, as if God were appealing through us. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20. So, in closing, our last slide, and in summary, we may say that Paul experienced his role as an apostle by the direct will of God for him. He gave total, humble submission to this will. Come hell or holy wrath of Jews or Christians, Paul would never be deterred from his vocation to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. And thanks be to God for us because we needed that kind of gumption to get out there. Nevertheless, Paul was no maverick apostle. I don't, I don't think he's implying that. He always worked within the structure of the early church. He was very obedient, just like as a soldier, he would go out there for the Sanhedrin. He was always obedient to the command, like a military guy. He had labored with the approval of the Jerusalem authorities. And as he told the Galatians, these authorities recognized that I had been entrusted with the gospel for the uncircumcised, just as Peter was for the circumcised. And recognizing, too, the favor bestowed on me, those who were the acknowledged pillars, James, Cephas, and John, gave Barnabas and me the hand clasp of fellowship, signifying that we should go to the Gentiles as they to the Jews. So that's our closing thought. Father O'Brien mentioned Gordon Lightfoot. Everybody ever heard of him, a singer, Gordon Lightfoot? He said he remarked, quote, the Gentile church founded on the rock must be handed over to the wise master builder to enlarge and complete. That's so true. Of course, I went through on the internet trying to find, is that from a song? Because I couldn't think of a song that that came from. It must have been something he was being just quoted from. But he wrote that song, The Way I Feel, and the Edmund Fitzgerald. The, um, there's some really good songs that he wrote. But uh, anyways, that was a good closing statement. So that's it. We'll close up, and then we'll finish off at our Christmas party, Section C, Grace and Peace. And let's see what we have to look forward to. We have, what was Paul's favorite wish for us? Might not be exactly what you think. Two, the truth behind shalom and its effect on Satan. Those are always good ones. Three, what is the opposite of shalom? So make sure we really understand it. Might Paul reprimand us as he did the Galatians? Got to think about that. Now I want you to lay awake at night, every night, worrying about this. Okay? It would only be fit before Christmas. So five, how would today's news reporters be viewed then? That's a good one. They wrote in a whole different style then. It would be kind of funny if you could bring somebody from the past up here and have a watch television. Do you imagine? Okay, six. What did they understand? And seven, to proclaim the gospel is to proclaim exactly what? You think you know exactly. Well, we're going to learn some more. Eight, in doing so, what is the immediate effect? What happens right away? And nine, the victory and the judge, what we now know. All righty, so we'll see you next time.